I'll do do a quick introduction for myself. I'm a new face. I know folks are used to seeing uh, William maybe from our team, but I'm stepping in as a host for today's Talking Circle webinar. She'e Josie Raffalito Yinchia, Bilagana Nishnato Hatsoi Bashishin, Ado Bilagana E Dasha Che Do Tori Koje E Dasha Nale, Klochina Dene E Ado Nasha. My name is Josie Raffalito. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Uh, originally from Raymond, Navajo, New Mexico, um, and currently live out on traditional Haudenosaunee land uh, here in Buffalo, New York. And I serve as a research project coordinator here with the Center for Indigenous Cancer Research uh, with Dr. Herring and our team. Uh, so very glad to be here with everyone and welcome you to our Talking Circle webinar session. Um, you know, our team at the Center for Indigenous Cancer Research created the webinar series to highlight um, experts, colleagues, some friends, um, and the work that they're doing aimed at improving health and wellness with and for uh, Indigenous communities. So today we will um, have some participants that you may have seen before or been able to or have had the luck to be at a conference and listen to some of their work, um, but really glad to be able to have a conversation about cancer health disparities among um, our communities, American Indians, Alaska Natives, um, and discuss areas of development specific to early diagnosis um, through cancer screening. So they are both a wealth of knowledge and, um, you know, as part of recognizing November as Native American Heritage Month, um, it's just great that we're able to pull this um, discussion together and um, have these experts joining us today who are very busy and literally saving lives from, from time to time and doing the research. And so just very um, grateful for, for you to be joining us. So let's go ahead and have Dr. Kaur um, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Dr. Judith Salmon Kaur. I'm Choctaw and Cherokee from Oklahoma. I am currently on staff at Mayo Clinic in Florida and have been here the last seven years as Director of Native American Programs and Outreach Activities, and a medical oncologist and palliative care specialist. I also spent 21 years in Rochester, Minnesota, so seniority has its privileges to go from all that snow and cold down to, I promise you, I'm not going to show you a palm tree today, but it's <laughs> lovely outside. So um, I'm very delighted to have uh, the uh, cancer for Indigenous Cancer Research host, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Marilyn Rubido from University of Michigan, and me from Mayo Clinic to talk with you so that we can share with you some of the historical efforts to improve cancer screening and understanding in Native communities about cancer. Um, but we really want to encourage you to do some of your own um, uh, education, uh, go to some of the websites like Native American Cancer Data.org from SEER, go to uh, uh, Roswell Park's website and uh, the Native Circle uh, areas so that you get information you need. And we need the next generation. I'm ready to retire. I have three grandchildren, the first one in college, and and uh, I don't plan to stop working on Native health, but we need the young ones like Rodney uh, to step up and Whitney and other people around the country. And uh, so we encourage you to take on this work and, and all the gratif gratification that it provides for us to be able to help our communities. So um, later on, I'll show a few slides and I'm going to say hi to Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Judith. Hi, everyone. Hi, Josie. So um, I'm Dr. Rubido. I'm, as Judith said, I'm uh, I'm a radiologist who works at University of Michigan. I've been here for a long time, about 30 years. But originally, I was from Idaho and Utah, and went to medical school in Utah. So I'm originally from the West, a little bit transplanted, uh, just like Josie is a little transplanted from the West. It's different, isn't it? It's different, but interesting and nice. Um, so I'm happy to speak to you today. Mainly today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about breast cancer and colon cancer screening. So Josie, should we start yet? Sure thing. Yes, go ahead and pull up your slides. 
And for folks tuning in, um, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to put those in the um, chat here in Zoom. And we will um, have Whitney Ann from our team um, monitoring that and we'll pull them up as we're able to um, towards the end of the, the discussion. Um, so, all right, let me know if you can see this okay and I'll be ready to advance the slides too. Okay, great. Um, so I already introduced myself. I'm going to talk about breast cancer, lung cancer, and cervical cancer. This is a short PowerPoint. So you don't have, if you have attention deficit disorder, it's okay. This is a little bit about myself. I'm a member of the Iowa Tribe of Kansas in Nebraska. And this is our tribal powwow from a few years ago and the um, famous bear claw necklace from the chief in the 1800s. Next slide. Um, one of the earliest outreach activities I've been involved in was a screening mammography and cervical cancer clinic that was launched by pathologists at the McLaughlin Clinic in South Dakota and also at the Rosebud Hospital. So here I am reading some mammogram back in the old days when we used a magnifying glass, but now we have digital computers to do it. And this was a group of people who came to that outreach. Next slide. And this is the Spirit of Eagles group of which I was fortunate to be a part of, organized by, headed by Dr. Judith Cower, who's on this broadcast. Uh, here we are in 2005. Uh, next, um, hit the next, yeah, there we go. And here we are in 2015. There's Judith and also you'll recognize the person here, Rodney Herring. This was a group of people who were interested in healthcare disparities among American Indians and Alaskan Natives, and we would have regular meetings and design activities and educational uh, projects and also conferences to address these healthcare disparities. And it was uh, a very rewarding situation and group to be with. Next slide. Well, as you know, mammography access is somewhat limited and it's because that this is an imaging test, the only imaging test that is heavily regulated by the FDA ever since 1990. And that's because prior to 1990, there were some really bad mammograms being done out there. So FDA decided to regulate mammography. That's the only thing that FDA regulates when it comes to imaging tests, nothing else is regulated, only mammography. And they are extensive regulations. They're practically like the tax code. And these regulations are so extensive and so complex that it makes mammography impractical for most small clinics and hospitals in rural areas. So unfortunately, mammography is more scarce in rural areas than our CAT scanners, which are very high-tech expensive machines, much more than mammography machines. So that makes mammography a little bit harder to get for average people, especially in rural areas. Next slide. I was affiliated with a mobile mammography unit that served 17 clinics of the Great Plains Indian Health Service. Click it again, advance it again, yeah. Um, this shows the mammography unit. It, was, it used satellite transmission at first to transmit the slides to Michigan so that the mammograms could be read by the radiologist there. And you're probably wondering, why did they have to go all the way to Michigan? Well, um, or why did the images have to go so far from South Dakota to Michigan? And the reason is because um, I agreed to help out in this work as, as I heard about it through the Spirit of Eagles. So this would have only happened, this only happened because of the network of the Spirit of Eagles that Judith Cower founded. And uh, this outreach project, which was a very long time, 12 years, wouldn't really have happened without the Spirit of the Eagles support and collaboration that I had with the people there. So this was a wonderful uh, work that we did then. and the, Unit stopped operating in 2017 because it was run by the Indian Health Service. It wasn't run by University of Michigan or by me, but it was run by the um, then Aberdeen Area Indian Health Service, now Great Plains 
and in health service and everything worked really well and we got mammograms then for women who live in this rural area. Next slide. And here's the mobile unit. Hit a key and maybe the little truck. There it goes. See, now you can see it. <laughs> the mobile unit went like thousands of miles every year to do mammograms in all of the 17 Indian Health Service clinics of that um, Great Plains area. Next slide. So that wasn't the first mobile unit. Actually, mobile screening mammography was started among Native people in the 1990s by a radiologist named Mike Lindbergh, who's still practicing and pretty old. And he used a, a mobile unit to serve all of the tribes of New Mexico. And that was a really heroic effort at that time. And it only discontinued because the state of New Mexico decided that they had to mandate physical exams with the mobile unit, or sorry, with all mammograms. And that was sort of impractical. So that was the um, end of operations of that unit. But it ran about eight or 10 years, and that was great. Next. So there are still mobile units, and they're they're increasing in number all around the United States, and fortunately, making mammography more available to people in rural areas, which has been a problem. This is the Bay Mills Indian Community Reservation Tribal Screening Mammography Mobile Unit um, that is now operating up in the um, upper Mich upper peninsula of Michigan, and. Now mobile mammography has increased nationwide to 106 units. So this is increasing mobile, this is increasing mammography to rural areas and will be a help to all of us in getting cancer screening to these women. Next. So just a few of the health disparities we should learn about, about Alaska Natives and American Indians with regards to breast cancer. Breast cancer is diagnosed at younger age in these women as compared to um, non-Hispanic white women. The death rates from breast cancer have not decreased among Native women in the last 20 years, unlike how they have decreased pretty dramatically in white and African-American women. So there's still more screening and more work to do out there in Indian country. The mammography screening rates remain low among American Indians and Alaska Natives, and it's partially due to the rural areas that they live in and the lack of mammography in those areas. Also, younger women of American Indians have higher death rates. There are fewer lumpectomies and more mastectomies, especially in the Northern Plains. This is a disparity as compared to non-Hispanic white women. And breast cancer incidence also, interestingly, as Judith Tower has shown, and we'll get to that, that the incidence varies greatly by geographic area, unlike other racial groups. Next slide. This is Judith Tower's um, work that she has presented in uh, many cancers, but this is breast cancer. It shows you that uniquely, among American Indian women, the rates of breast cancer are higher in some areas than in white women. Alaska and the, the Southern Plains in particular. And yet oftentimes you'll hear people give talks and they'll say that breast cancer is less prevalent in American Indian women. Well, that's not true. It's only true in the Southwestern United States for whatever reason, we don't know why, but that's not true for all American women all American Indian women. In fact, the incidence of breast cancer is greater in the Southern Plains and Alaska than it is in white women in those eight, in those locations. Next, and yay for Judith Tower for putting out this data. Um, there are other breast cancer disparities in American Indian women. Those who are less than 50 years old have about one and a half times higher risk of invasive breast cancer as compared to non-Hispanic white women. And in the Northern Plains and Southern Plains and Alaska, they have rates about one and a half times higher than white women of having late stage cancer. So there's still more work to do. Next, that's just a mammogram by the way. Now, as most of you know, these are the locations of indigenous populations. 40% uh, are not urban, but are rural. And this shows the, um, the rates 
and where most of the tribal reservations are in the west, with a few scattered in the east. Next slide, or next, hit the key again. Yeah. Okay, hit it one more time. Um, yep, okay, yep, okay, do it one more time. Yep, okay, that's fine. Um, this shows you where all the blue is where mammography is, okay? So you'll notice most of the mammography in the United States is over here in the Eastern United States. And where all those Indian reservations were, there's practically no mammography here in the West. The light blue is no mammograms, and the dark blue is where all of the mammograms are. So this is a geographic disparity in mammography for American Indian women. Next. And because of that, American Indian women have the longest mean travel times to get a mammogram of any racial group. And certainly the rural areas make it more difficult. Next. Travel time for Native American women is, this is this yellow bar here. This is for mammography. And see how much longer it is for a Native American woman to get to mammography compared to any other racial group. And secondly, for MRI, it's super long compared to other racial groups, twice as long almost as compared to white women. Next. Okay, on to a little bit about lung cancer. I'll talk about screening. Screening has come now for lung cancer, which is great. Uh, to be eligible, you need to be age 50 and have 20 pack years of smoking. And there are special CT scanners for this. They are now nationally widely available, didn't used to be, but are now. Although they may not be at Indian Health Service hospitals, but they are pretty widely available. Next slide. Uh, this shows in South Dakota, all these little blue places. These are all fixed stationary facilities, not mobile units, but, but x-ray places that patients can go to and get their lung cancer screening done, even down in these areas down around the Rosebud Reservation. So this is pretty magical that now uh, lung cancer screening has become so available. And this looks like it's up close to McLaughlin. So this is very much more easy and accessible than it used to be. Next. There are 800 lung cancer screening sites, and most of the screen-detected lung cancers that are found by screening are early stage and curable, which is great because lung cancer is really a deadly disease. The increased use of these CT scans might decrease the association of rural patients having worse lung cancer outcomes. So hopefully this is going to show up in the future that rural patients will have better outcomes because of lung cancer screening. And this is a mobile unit that drives around. So that's fair, that makes it even more accessible. Next. Now just a few words, I'm almost done with this little talk about cervical cancer detection. So as we all women know, checking for cervical cancer normally means a trip to your doctor's office. Next. That might be changing. I have a colleague here at Michigan Medicine who's a family practitioner and researcher, and she has been working for a few years on making a home test for cervical screening. And these are HPV self-sampling um, kits. She also is focusing on underserved communities to try to bring this screening to women who normally face barriers to getting screened for cervical cancer. She is interested in expanding community partnerships and future collaborations and wants to build connections with Native American uh, communities to um, bring this work and this uh, innovation that she has designed to uh, the communities that really need it and that um, might really benefit, especially in patients who are more elderly or handicapped. Next slide. So this is a home-based cervical cancer screening. Um, and this will use um, home self-sampling kits. So it looks like it's something like a tampon that's being developed or has been developed for self-collected samples. And this can be completed at home. And also sort of like our COVID test, you can send them back through the mail. 
unlike the traditional pap smear where you have to be there in person. Right? Next slide. So this clinical trial is currently recruiting participants, women who are age 46 to 65, who especially have a physical disability or mobility impairment, trouble getting to medical care in any way. They are also paid $50 in the mail by participating in this home-based cervical cancer screening. So if you know anyone out there who is interested in participating in this trial, especially um, physicians, if we can make this more known to um, doctors who are taking care of women gynecologists, uh, then we can, she can make progress in finding if this is an effective way to screen for cervical cancer. Next slide. And that's all I have to tell you today. Get screened, get patient screened for breast, colon, lung, and cervical cancers. And another place for breast health resources is at this website, sbionline.org. Lots of breast cancer um, educational information there. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for, for sharing those the slides. And I think also mm -hmm. that some of the animation um, was lively and great too. <laughs> um, but, um, we, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that we keep an eye on the chat too, and we'll, we'll circle back to, to those questions um, because I know that we can build on the conversation and invite uh, Dr. Cower to, to join and I can pull up your slides as well. So just give me one moment. All right, thank you, Josie. Uh, so I want to emphasize a couple of things that uh, Dr. Rubido, uh, my friend Marilyn, already uh, mentioned to you, but let's just really hone in on the importance of early detection and screening. Screening is for women and men who have no symptoms of lung cancer or colon cancer or um, liver cancer, et cetera. It's meant to take healthy people, find cancer at the earliest possible date, and then be able to cure them. So that needs a whole sequence of events from access to screening, to getting the reports back to the physician and the patient, to setting up other tests that may be needed to confirm or deny whether there's cancer. And then the other way that we change survival is what I do with medical oncology and what radiation oncology does, new treatment options, things that are going to treat cancer. Obviously, we'd like to prevent cancer wherever possible. That's why things like smoking cessation are still so important. We can't just rely on people having access to the CT scans in their region in order to prevent lung cancer. The screening tests are defined at the earliest possible date. A couple of other things. Um, this first slide shows you that we have a wonderful website that was developed with the Spirit of Eagles and the SEER registry down in New Mexico uh, that shows you where to find the most recent cancer data and puts it in a form and also gives you articles to read if you want more information to present at conferences. But here is a slide, for example, on liver cancer where you can see that American Indians and Alaska Natives in green have much higher rates of liver cancer than any of the non-Hispanic white groups across the country. And that there are regional differences. There are differences in Alaska uh, and other places. So uh, as Marilyn said, you can't just paint uh, the brush and say all Indians are alike that the Navajo are the same as the Choctaw or that the uh, Lakota are the same as the uh, Anishinaabe. So you need to arm yourself with accurate data from your area if you are going to make a difference in terms of really prioritizing screening and access to care for your patient population. And we need more researchers who are public health advocates. We know what we've seen with COVID that 
it pointed out a lot of the problems with um, access to good care and the uh, the problem that we have in Native communities that people don't just have one problem. They have, you know, multiple comorbidities. And that was incredibly important to recognize that that made them at much higher risk for, um, for COVID. Um, just as we have uh, a lot of people who have more than one risk factor for colorectal cancer. Uh, another thing to emphasize is that some of the screening recommendations have changed. Colorectal cancer now has decreased down to 45. Um, and uh, that's, that means that at 45, a lot of people need to consider with their primary physician talking about colonoscopy versus FIT versus some of these new um, multi-targeted DNA tests like Cologuard. Any cancer screening is better than no cancer screening. Uh, but for colorectal, there are some things going on in Alaska to compare fit with the newer tests. And it, again, is part of what Marilyn was emphasizing. If you make it easier for people to get tested at home, instead of having to send them into Anchorage or having to send them to uh, Rapid City uh, to get a mammogram or to get a colon test, um, you are going to have better access and uptake of, of screening tests. Um, so I think that's important. And then there are some new screening tests like the Spiro CT and uh, Roswell Park is going to be spearheading for your region, uh, access to those Spiro CTs and using um, the same criteria that they use to get the approvals for that, namely, if people have a 20 pack year or more smoking history and uh, they smoke now or have quit within 15 years and are between 50 and 80 years of age, those are the people that need to be screened. Um, when we were getting together this morning and talking about, well, what are we going to talk about and how are we gonna talk about prioritizing? I said, you know, um, I'm a non-smoker. I've always been a non-smoker. I'm not considered the highest risk person for lung cancer. So I'm not someone that should go for the low dose uh, spiral CT. That doesn't mean I can't get lung cancer. My parents smoked, you know, my mother died of lung cancer. So passive smoke is part of my, my past history. So if I develop symptoms, I'm going to go sooner rather than later in terms of shortness of breath or a cough that won't go away. Um, and I hope it's not COVID. <laughs> so, so, you know, you need to look at the individual risk factors. We can't screen every hundred, hundred percent of people in Indian countries. So we have to use our resources wisely. And that's why Marilyn was talking about this new trial for cervical cancer that you can screen at home. And we need research that will give us better tools and that will give us access to more care. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about liver cancer in a minute, but as far as cervical cancer, I did wanna to emphasize too that um, native communities have done a wonderful job of uptake of the HPV vaccine. Uh, and that long-term is going to decrease the rates, not only of cervical cancer, but of head and neck cancers, for example, or penile cancer in men, which they don't talk about, but it will decrease other cancers. But you still have to do pap screening in women who've had uh, the HPV vaccines. It's very important because um, we learn more about how the vaccine works and protects um, the majority of types of HPV that cause uh, cervical cancer, but maybe not all just as we've learned that the COVID vaccines uh, don't 100% prevent COVID, but they may make it easier to overcome COVID. It may mean you don't end up in the hospital on a ventilator, et cetera, et cetera. So those are things that we learn about the importance of vaccines, but also some of the limitations of the vaccines that we recommend all the time. And it doesn't mean we don't recommend the vaccines or don't recommend the boosters, but we know that nothing is, is perfect. And certainly where native people have less access, we don't want them to um, not report to their local uh, clinic if they're having problems. And then a new cancer that hasn't gotten a lot of 
uh, press is liver cancer. And I'm going to talk a, a bit about that. So um, next slide, please. So that's the lung cancer screening trial. And I mentioned that the, uh, that trial was done with high-risk people and it did show a reduction in death from lung cancer. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that uh, there are some risks to any screening, um, whether it's a mammogram that might lead to a biopsy that wasn't necessary or a lung cancer screening that might lead to a biopsy. Uh, of someone who doesn't have lung cancer. But in the overall scheme of things, you're trying to balance off better good versus a small chance that someone will have a, a, an unwanted side effect. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. So in colorectal cancer screening, uh, I emphasize that, you know, um, most adults know that they are supposed to have uh, colon cancer uh, screening, and uh, most primary physicians recommend uh, colonoscopy as the screening technique, but more and more people are choosing less invasive techniques. Um, although I will say my daughter who turned 50 this year, her doctor said, nope, you have to have a colonoscopy. My husband had some benign polyps, which meant my daughter had to have the colonoscopy. She couldn't have the newfangled uh, um, multi-targeted DNA test, even though she wanted it. So it is a conversation for everyone as far as what are the risks and now starting that screening at age 45. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna talk uh, in the remaining couple of minutes uh, before we go to questions and, and interviews. Um, we know that fatty liver is a major uh, risk factor for developing liver cancer. Um, people talk about alcohol consumption, very important for uh, alcoholic cirrhosis and the development of liver cancer, but non-alcoholic cirrhosis occurs with fatty liver, which occurs in a lot of our diabetics and also as a result of obesity. And horribly, it can start even in childhood. So we're starting research that's trying to understand who will we screen? What do we do when we recognize fatty liver? And there are some new tests for what's called NASH or fatty infiltration of the liver, NAFL, um, that hopefully will shed light on this uh, particular cancer because um, the reason for screening is also that you may have treatments available. There are some new clinical trials looking at drugs that might reverse um, fatty liver. Um, there also are lifestyle changes that can reverse uh, for some people fatty liver. So recognizing that risk factor and developing new tests and hopefully things non-invasive so that it doesn't necessarily always involve a liver biopsy, but right now that is the gold standard. Um, and it's that that kind of inflammation in the liver leads to scar tissue or fibrosis, which then we know has a sequence of events that can lead to liver cancer, which, you know, short of um, removing portions of liver or having a liver transplant today is not a highly curable disease. So, you know, we are focusing on things that we can do that will change the outcome of liver problems for native people. And it is true that that uh, is very high in certain regions of the population, again, such as in Alaska, such as the Northern Plains, the Southern Plains, uh, less so down in uh, Arizona. But all of the groups need to be aware that this is now becoming one of the highest uh, causes for liver cancer across the country in both native and non-native people. So education and awareness is the first step to trying to change some of those things. And, and so I want you to know a little bit about liver cancer and the fact that it is on the horizon. We've made such progress in cervical cancer um, some progress in breast cancer, which again can improve with earlier detection and more uh, uh, sequential screening and the use of MRI. As Marilyn said, uh, it's a lot harder for our native women to access uh, MRI scans that can pick up 
sometimes the subtle differences that get missed on a, a routine mammogram. So I'm hoping that uh, all of you will be interested in finding ways that we can defeat cancer with early detection. And, uh, oh, that's the uh, slide that didn't work so well. The, this really high bar is Alaska and colorectal cancer. Some of the highest rates of colon cancer in the world are in Alaska, which is why Dr. Diana Red, Redwood and her group in Alaska are doing this um, this community-based trial on FIT versus uh, multi-targeted DNA to assess for colon cancer risk. All right, so now uh, let's discuss things. Hey, wonderful. Thank you both so much for <clears throat> sharing some background and information, some exciting updates and um, developments that are happening. I mean, just, you know, learning from your experiences and understanding, you know, the true um, gaps in access and services and the disparities that uh, stem from that in addition to other, um, you know, uh, social determinants of health. I mean, it's incredible to see what, um, what are some of the, I guess, solutions that are being developed when it comes to um, mobile screening units. I mean, that's, um, to know that that has been happening for, for decades now and developing more and more is truly exciting. Um, and then now some of the, the updates around um, home screening tests, like that's, that's incredible. Um, and, you know, I think as, um, as I was listening and, listening and hearing, I have so many questions to ask, but I guess the first one that I'll throw out there to, to both of you is, you know, it, it takes... A, a full um, unit of care to support an individual through the process of cancer care continuum, right? There's, um, we have family members, we have cl clinicians and um, wondering if you would uh, wanna speak to um, another person who may be in the room and in conversations who would also um, support that process um, as patient navigators. Um, we have a new uh, service here with our team that um, is able to provide that to community members. So just wanna bring that into the conversation as well as another um, part of solution building. Um, okay, um, go ahead, Marilyn. Patient navigation is, is so important and useful because there are so many steps. I just deal with breast cancer, but there's a whole bunch of steps that have to take place. And it can be very confusing to patients once you get that diagnosis of cancer, what happens next and why, and what are all the different steps and who's gonna help them get through it. Um, so patient navigator and patient navigation is a really important part of cancer treatment. And Judith, I think can talk more to that than I can because she's a clinician. Well, um, absolutely, as Marilyn knows, when someone has a diagnosis of uh, uh, something found on a mammogram, having someone to be supportive who can answer questions on a layperson's level. Um, and doctors are often very busy and they don't even realize that they speak a foreign language, you know? And we get so used to the terminology that, for example, when someone says, well, you had a positive biopsy, a lot of the patients that I see in oncology think, oh, well, that's a good thing then. Yep. No, it means it was cancer. So that's, you know, that doesn't always translate for us. So a patient navigator can bring it down to, this is not a normal mammogram. This is, this is a biopsy that needs further checkups. These are the things we're going to schedule for you. Um, the other thing about navigation is that cancer involves a whole family. Um, during COVID, I was doing all telemedicine because my husband has cancer. He has not just one cancer, but two cancers. He has a common cancer and he has a rare cancer. And so I couldn't take the chance of bringing, bringing COVID home from Mayo Clinic and having my husband end up dying. And in fact, as a cancer patient, he's one of those where vaccination doesn't work. And so he had to have monoclonal antibodies, for example. A lot of people wouldn't know that, wouldn't even know to ask for that. 
So navigators know some of the questions that that patients need to ask the doctors or that need interpreted for them. Uh, and in some cases, they need it interpreted in their own language. Like uh, years ago, we did a project with Dene College down in Arizona where uh, the elders went through and translated Navajo language into a cancer glossary. And uh, one of our new navigators in Arizona, uh, Trudy uh, Jackson, uh, said, I heard that there was a, a Navajo glossary, but I don't know how to find it. So I had to get it to her because now she's down in Navajo country and it's helpful to have things that are written in that language. Um, there may be other parts of the country where there are, um, there are language translators available in the clinics that you serve. But navigators are a friendly face. They help to keep things coordinated. They help to keep things not so scary. Uh, I serve on, a, on an advisory board for the Oklahoma Cancer Center Stevenson in Oklahoma City. Uh, and uh, they have four navigators and they have done a tremendous job of, of uh, helping Native women access clinical trials for cervical cancer, for example. And uh, we can thank Dr. James Hampton and, and we honor his memory that he is one that started all of this about, let's get the right information, let's look at the regional differences, let's provide more resources. And so, Patient navigation has come of age and a lot of cancer centers now make that part of the cancer care continuum. Thank you. And we're really um, fortunate to be able to create this uh, service here at Roswell Park um, and have indigenous um, patient navigators from the communities and building those connections and um, relationships and trust. So um, Whitney and Henry from our team is our patient navigator coordinator. Um, and so just really proud of the work that they're doing and appreciate their, their leadership and commitment. Um, and on that note, I do we, we did get a question that I wanna read here, which I think is very timely in the conversation um, that notes mobile screening units and patient navigation programs can be very expensive. Yes, they can be. Um, any um, sustainable solutions um, to increase access and utilization of female breast cancer screening services? The question to the two of you. Um, and then a follow-up question to that is, what partnerships, whether it's you know tribal, state, national, or federal, need to be strengthened? So that, that is in the chat if you're able to read, if you want to reread that. but. Yeah, just looking for ideas for sustainable solutions to, um, to build up those types of programs. So uh, I will say that when it comes to cost effectiveness, the ability for patients to get early care that's going to potentially cure cancer is the most cost effective care you can have. So if you focus your resources on high-risk populations, uh, if you do good family histories to know who's had breast cancer in their family, who's had colon cancer, whose um, parents smoked like mine did, um, then you, you can try to streamline the, the budget to meet. There was a time when cancer was like seven on the list of priorities for, um, for tribal health boards in terms of referrals. So women and children came first in terms of maternity and, and early uh, childcare, which is very important and made great strides during earlier generations. Um, but the knowledge of what cancer is doing to ravage our communities now um, has moved cancer up on that priority list. And so uh, everyone has to advocate within their own health board for where those uh, healthcare dollars are spent. Um, it also is important to recognize the role of the uh, Obamacare, and there's been uh, a lot of back and forth over the last several years about whether people should um, sign up for Obamacare uh, or uh, use only tribal health services. And, and um, Obamacare has opened up colorectal cancer screening, for example, and shown a dramatic difference in a lot of underserved populations. 
Thank you. Dr. Obadu, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I was going to answer a question by someone named Frank Anumakwam, MD, uh, who wanted to know more information about the home HPV cervical cancer study. So um, I'm going to let's see, try to answer his message and see if that works. That was the last slide on my, um, there it is. It's on the chat now. Uh, that's the phone number and then the website if you want to see more about the cervical cancer screening study. Wonderful. Okay. And I see one about liver cancer uh, from KB up at the top. Any association with liver cysts and liver cancer? So if they are simple cysts, that is not um, a risk factor for liver cancer. Complex cysts, uh, uh, where there's partly solid, partly liquid uh, can be uh, important for going the next step for better imaging or for uh, uh, hepatitis B testing or uh, MRI elastography to look at the texture of the liver in that area. But liver cysts and kidney cysts are very, very common benign things across all populations. And so just a simple liver cyst is probably not a problem if it's a good um, ultrasound. Marilyn, do you want to talk about uh, the use of ultrasound for uh, for liver problems? Um, yeah, look, ultrasound's getting better at detecting abnormal livers. Like it can, it's getting so it can measure what's called liver stiffness. If you have a stiff liver, that's not a good thing. And being able to detect it as well as detecting fatty liver, especially in children and teenagers, so that you can intervene. Because fatty liver, um, my understanding is this can lead to hepatic fibrosis, which can lead to liver cancer. So um, screening may need to be started actually in children and teenagers for the liver problem, and yes, uh, ultrasound is getting better, so we maybe can use ultrasound instead of CAT scans or MRIs, which are very expensive tests um, to evaluate this problem. So that's still evolving, but I think it's going to be coming that liver ultrasound can be a way of, of detecting liver problems better than it has in the past, and it's relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah, and if a liver cyst is indeterminate, then a follow up. Uh scan of some type or a repeat um, ultrasound in a few months might be worthwhile if the liver function tests are normal and the hepatitis B screening uh, is negative. Um, but overall, liver cysts are not the problem. As Marilyn no. said, it's fibrosis exactly. and fatty liver that then leads to fibrosis that then leads to the sequence of events that can cause liver cancer. That's, that's what the research is focusing on. A lot of people have liver cysts. My cousin had a huge one, um, but it's just a water collection. It's really not related to getting liver cancer. So your tumor board should be educated about liver cysts if they are simple cysts and, and only water filled and not with any solid ingredients. And then we had a question here. Um, this is from Joel Begay. Hi, Joel. Um, I almost showed Joel's picture that I had in Michigan. He was in Michigan um, with me, and it was great. Um, <laughs> Joel asked, mobile screening units and patient navigation programs can be very expensive. What are sustainable solutions, increase access, um, and utilization of female breast cancer screening services? These are questions that you can tell came from somebody who got an MPH. Excellent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right. These can be expensive, but then we have to talk to people about how detecting a cancer early is the lowest cost and, you know, intervention you can do to find a cancer when it's only five millimeters is great. You can cure it, at least in a breast. Um, so, and the patient navigation programs can be expensive, but we have to figure out, some of you MPH people need to figure out how to show that these can be cost-effective. I think that they are, but 
I guess it would need to be more study about it to prove how much does a patient navigation program really cost the hospital system, the insurers, the patients. And so, go ahead. Yeah, the, the National Cancer Institute did fund a number of patient navigation studies back in the uh, uh, early 2000s, and uh, there have been some publications that showed cost effectiveness. Most of them just talked about feasibility, but there are a few publications on cost effectiveness, and uh, maybe we can find a, a reference to uh, send to Josie and Whitney uh, that, um, that then can be shared. The other thing I would say about partnerships, the epicenters that collect the information for your region are so very important, and those now have been strengthened and uh, have really excellent people uh, throughout the country uh, that can tell you what your particular region's um, high risk uh, uh, areas are. So uh, I would say a partnership with your, your, um, your region's epicenter would be extremely important for making the arguments. And, and your regions, every region has an NIH designated cancer center and those cancer centers are, um, this is part of their purpose in life is outreach and helping people get cancer care. And the cancer centers also have uh, possibly more funds and more ways to help with financial costs as compared to a regular hospital. So when you have cancer, look on the internet, you can find them, NIH designated cancer centers. There's more than one in most states, and every state generally has one. So when the cancer is the diagnosis, go to your NIH designated cancer center and um, see if you can get, there's all kinds of resources and help at those places as compared to a, a regular average run of the mail grocery store hospital. However, in Alaska, there is no NCI designated cancer center. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, but most most states do have them, and that is an important resource. The American Cancer Society and other nonprofits uh, that focus on um, quality of care and access to care for cancer patients and quality of life issues uh, also are important to partner with and. Uh, uh, I can remember uh, back when the uh, Armstrong Foundation, Lance Armstrong's foundation, did a number of studies in, in uh, Indian country uh, about different cancers. And, um, and certainly uh, Komen Foundation uh, that, Marilyn, I know you're very familiar with. Um, I think our nonprofits really suffered under COVID also in terms of being able to do their drives or get their donations and that kind of thing. And hopefully they will be strengthened as we get past this pandemic. Um, but while they can't fund cancer care, they can often do other things to help the cancer patient. And they certainly do uh, a lot of good education and supportive things. Mm -hmm. I know our cancer center has a special office for patients who have financial issues to go to and help try to work it out. Yeah, and most large hospitals or referral centers don't realize that Indian Health Service is not insurance. Right. They just don't understand the system. And so it takes someone like a navigator who can really help them understand how do you get, you know, uh, transportation for a family member to come? How do you get the drugs out to the reservation and, and so forth? So. Um, and oftentimes being in a clinical trial is the very best way to get the top quality care. Exactly. Um, my friend Linda B, Linda B and I uh, spoke at the meeting in Tucson a couple of weeks ago. That's always been a, one of her mantras, you know, being in a clinical trial guarantees you are going to get at least standard of care and oftentimes better care and access earlier to, uh, to the, the latest drugs. Oh, there's four new messages. Uh-oh. Yeah, I think Where that kind of the last question about um, are you seeing more natives uh, entering clinical trials? That, that was the last question that I saw. Okay, I can speak to that since I uh, was on a uh, disparities committee for the Alliance, which is one of the large 
uh, clinical trials groups across the country. And back 25 years ago when I joined Mayo, there were like only 2% of minority patients at all who were on clinical trials. And now it's up to 20%. And in some cases where it's, it's symptom management and quality of life, it's up to 40% uh, of uh, patients are involved in some clinical trial. And we have seen more natives in areas like South Dakota and uh, uh, and uh, larger states um, as well, um, not as many as we'd like. And it's often the logistics of getting patients to the cancer center early enough to qualify for a trial. So the earlier we find them, the sooner they get referred to a major cancer center like Roswell or Mayo or Michigan, the better. Thank you. And I do want to be um, respectful of time. I know we're a couple minutes over, but it was such a great conversation and lots of really good questions. Um, if we do have time, I want to ask one more question um, to, to both of you. And I think that it kind of helps, you know, continue the circle of all the different um, uh, ideas for solutions and, and impact. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, any suggestions or um, ideas for policy change that will help um, increase access to, to screening? I know earlier on we talked about some of the heavy regulation from the FDA um, and in some states some of the um, uh, physical exams that are required before actual um, mammography. So those things were jumping out to me, but I would love to hear if there if you want to speak to that a bit more, if there are other ideas that you would want to put out there for some of us policy wonks. <laughs> yeah, well, um, most places don't require physical examination before mammograms. So that, that's not a common or universal requirement. And typically you can just show up and get your mammogram, but in most cases, you do have to have an order from your doctor, um, just an order, and they just send that to the mammogram facility. You don't have to go see your doctor to get a mammogram. You just have to call and say, I need an order for a mammogram, and they should just put it right in, although some doctors might say, well, I want to see you and do an exam first, but you don't have to have that done for screening mammography. You can just show up. In some places, you don't even have to have a doctor, but most places that do screening, they want a physician on record so that if your mammogram is abnormal, they know where to send that report to so that the, the, there'll be a doctor who can follow up on it. Um, and then what was your other question? I forgot now. What were... You know, just generally um, ideas for policy changes that can increase oh, policy happiness. changes. Well, I think it depends on what policy or what change regarding what particular thing. So it, it depends on the specifics. But if there, there are problems, then we need to try to address them with either national institutions, such as the Susan G. Komen Foundation, for example, or boards of radiology or boards of um, oncology, if there are things that don't seem right, then we can take them to the highest levels and try to see if there's action that can be done. And I would say that uh, moving uh, cancer diagnosis up to a high priority level for referral is an important policy for the uh, local health boards. Um, oftentimes it came down to what they called life and limb. Well, an early cancer uh, detection is not threatening to your life, uh, but a delay in treatment is. And so documenting how long it takes for uh, women or men to get referred to an appropriate cancer um, doctor is important in the medical record. So for example, when I was first doing data with, a, um, with uh, the Northern Plains tribes about cervical cancer delay in, in diagnosis and treatment, we found that it took an abnormal mammogram, or mammogram, abnormal <laughs> pap smear, nine months before the woman was referred for colposcopy. And that colposcopy wasn't available regionally. So that took more time if they didn't have it there. 
Um, and so uh, we were able to make the argument that we needed earlier referral for abnormal uh, pap smears and, and that did lead to change. So a policy as far as referral to an appropriate next step for an abnormal test would be very helpful on the local regional level. Um, there are no national standards, but they, they, there certainly are some for mammography. I think Marilyn, don't they say 60 days yeah. from, uh, from biopsy to start of treatment? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. very important to, I mean, it's not a, cancer is not an emergency. It's not like you're having a baby, but you can dilly-dally around with cancer. And sometimes we see patients who go from one institution to another institution to another institution wanting a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion. And before you know it, it's been four months since their cancer was diagnosed and nothing has happened. So that's inappropriate. You, we need to expedite care and treatment once there is a diagnosis and not go around. And hopefully the electronic medical records as they improve will also make it easier to transmit information between institutions. Uh, some of those care everywhere programs that, that we have in our, in our regions. Um, so uh, knowledge is power, getting the right knowledge to the right person at the right time that makes a difference for each patient. That's right. And it's often helpful to go to a designated NCI cancer center for a second opinion. And usually they can get you in relatively soon, a week or two, review your case and give you a second opinion as to what they think you have and what should be done. If there's any question in your mind. And usually second opinions don't cost very much money. So it's a reasonable thing to do. I agree with KB who says navigators help keep track of patient follow-up. Very important. Don't lose people between the cracks. Yep. Give them a chance to live. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both so very much and to all the participants who were able to join us today. Great questions, um, really helpful engagement and um, if there's, or if there are any final thoughts that either of you would want to share um, as we're wrapping up, I would absolutely welcome that. Um, but before, I'll just note, someone asked a question whether or not this would be, if the recording would be shared. Um, yes, it'll be made available on our CICR uh, website. The link is in the chat and you can view some of the previous um, webinar sessions that we've had before. So this will be up and available to share with others who weren't able to join today. So I'm um, really glad to be able to continue the conversation online and encourage folks to reach out to our team. Um, you know, we're, we're all learning together and a lot of shared um, um, experiences and perspectives and expertise to, to keep, um, you know, this larger movement to move forward um, to impact uh, our communities. So great. Yes. Thank you, Josie. Great. Thanks, Josie. Thank you all. Really appreciate Peace you. Peace and love. <laughs>